Erling Haaland has been nothing short of sensational since joining Borussia Dortmund. Manchester United were in for him. We didn't sign him. He joined Dortmund instead. And given his goal-scoring exploits there, you can't say that he made the wrong decision. But for a lot of United fans, Haaland would be the dream signing this summer. But what are the chances that he could leave Dortmund? What's the situation with Dortmund financially with the coronavirus? Have United's relationship with Dortmund, has it been poisoned with the Jadon Sancho stuff? What I'm going to do today is I'm joined by Jürgen Kurz from Ruhr Nachrichten, which is a very respected local Dortmund newspaper, to sort of give the inside story on Haaland. And thank you very much today for your time, Jürgen. Yeah, you're welcome. Pleasure to talk to you and I hope I can give you some insights that you don't have yet. I hope so as well. I mean, looking at the numbers from, from Haaland, it's ridiculous. He's in 46 games since joining Dortmund. He's got 45 goals and 11 assists. It's, it's outstanding. And on, on his current form, he's going to beat all the goal scoring records if he keeps this sort of early pace up. You know, how, how impressed have Dortmund been behind the scenes with, with Haaland's approach and his attitude as well as his on the pitch goal scoring exploits? Mm. Yeah, he's exceeded all expectations that there were. Um, I mean, one and, less than one and a half years ago, uh, we're looking at Holland. Okay, uh, someone who can be a really prospect, uh, someone who has shown his quality in Champions League matches too. Uh, but when you sign a 19-year-old young guy from Norway who's been in a in a top league not yet, uh, you don't know what to what to come and what uh, he will really achieve and how much he can even improve his high level that he already had. Uh, but uh, it seems like there is no limit for him by now. Um, after after a bit more than a year in Dortmund, the complete uh, its game style is all uh, directed uh, for Holland to score. Um, the complete uh, system works just for his benefit because he is just a uh, yeah an incredible scorer. Uh, he doesn't need too many chances, and he's there. And his his speed and his will and his his body and his physics and whatever he has, uh, you can really see it everywhere. You watch matches, you watch highlight clips, probably. Uh, He's outstanding, and uh, Borussia Dortmund knows that, and they're very happy to have him in the squad. Um, but at the same time, like uh, you asked that way, uh, they pretty sure know that he won't be a Borussia Dortmund player until the end of his career, that's for sure. Now, uh, Dortmund have long have a long-standing sort of a business model as a club to, to bring in players like Haaland, like Lewandowski, and, all, and, and sell them on for big profit and then replace them. And they you do extremely well at doing that. Now, what is um, what's Borussia Dortmund's financial position in terms of the coronavirus? How how has that affected it? Has it does it mean that Dortmund will be more forced to sell someone like Haaland or Sancho or both this summer to sort of make up for losses that have hit the club because of coronavirus? Is that the case? Mm. Yeah, let's start with the figures that are clear right now. Um, last year, the financial year, uh, they ended with a loss of forty five million euros, and then at the next half year. Two, there will be a more or less around about 100 million euros uh, that they haven't earned. Uh, so it will be difficult to, to replace that money. Um, they have credit lines with the banks. They, can, uh, they don't have to worry about selling players that they don't want to sell. But uh, at the same time, they must see whether the business model that you spoke about um, is doing well and what can happen this summer. Last year, um, Manchester United especially thought, OK, Borussia Dortmund is going to sell anyway. Uh, because they had been doing so for the last years before, but they didn't have to, and so they didn't. Finally, I guess uh, United was was looking for uh, for prices to drop and to fall, but it didn't. And uh, there was a clear um, appointment between the player and the club. Okay, if you bring uh, bring a club until the fifth of July, I think it was, then you can go, and if not, you stay. And uh, that was uh, agreed by by Jane Sancho, and the club does did well and being so strict and so clear in the communication, at least internally. Um, and so for, for the next summer, it will be again a difficult question. Do we have to sell a player at Borussia Dortmund? Not necessarily, I'd say. Um, is it likely to sell one of the big guns, uh, naming them uh, Jaden Sancho or Erling Haaland? I'd say yes, it's very likely that they sell one of them. Um, where is, are they going? Uh, difficult question. I think there are a lot of contenders and a lot of applicants who would love to sell one of them or even both. Um, I do not see a perspective that they sell both right now uh, because they still have chances to go to the Champions League and qualify for next year's uh, Champions League campaign. Uh, and if they don't fail in that, they will keep one of the players. And I would uh, rather say that they keep Erling Haaland and let Jaden Sancho go. 
Well, they, it, it seemed like they, they planned for Sancho leaving if, the, as you said, the right offer came in, but it didn't. And that was a painful summer for United fans. But uh, if, if, if Holden was to leave Borussia Dortmund this summer, what would, the, what would the expected price be? Given that next year, and we'll speak about this in the next question, he does have a release clause which kicks in. And, and Dortmund know full well that maybe this summer they could get more for him. Do you think that really does depend on whether or not Dortmund qualify for the Champions League or not, whether they can keep Holland or, or Sancho or either of the players, and how much do you think he would actually go for? Mm. Yeah, well, things have changed since last summer or since since one and a half years ago due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, definitely. And uh, it also affects uh, a lot of uh, the transfer business nationally, internationally. Uh, the prices might drop, but I don't think that the prices would drop too much for the for the uh, top niveau players. If you're at the highest level, you will still have to pay a lot of money. Not 200 and something for, for guys like Neymar, but uh, not much less for uh, than 100 million euros for guys like Erling Haaland or Jadon Sancho. Um, I think the, the fees will, will drop and fall uh, for the for the mid-class players. That's how it's expected in Germany, at least, um, but not for the very top ones. So if you look at Jadon Sancho or Erling Haaland, if there is an offer in the direction, in the area of 100 million euros, uh, the bosses in Dortmund will definitely start to think about it and, and to wonder whether it's smart or not to sell now or maybe at, at another time. Um, because at the same time, they're trying to change the squad that they have in summer and new coaches and managers coming in um, and they will have uh, some some people leave and some people coming in. Uh, and of course, uh, a big uh, reimbursement for, for one of the top players will make things easier to get into the new direction that they're looking at. Now, what what can you tell us about uh, Erling Haaland's release clause? Because uh, as we spoke about before uh, going live here, it, there's different figures that keep getting. Some saying 75 million, some saying 85 million euros. But that that release clause uh, was a big reason why United did not want to sign Haaland because we we didn't want to have that sort of control taken away from us, or knowing that in a few years we were going to lose him for a fixed amount of, pro- of money. Now, some people might say that was the wrong decision, given how incredible he's been. But what is the what is that release clause? What, what information can you tell us about it? And has that, has that sort of affected Haaland's relationship with Dortmund? Or do they just sort of accept that it's, it's part of the reason why they were able to sign him? Mm. Uh, Bristol Dortmund make, uh, made a big exception from, from the uh, plans they usually stick to uh, for signing Erling Haaland. Because they, uh, three, four years ago, they said, no, we don't do this thing, this release clauses anymore. Uh, they had some trouble with uh, Mario Götze leaving in 2013 and Ilkay Gündoğan leaving in 2014, 15, and Mats Hummels also made an exception because they wouldn't have been able to sign him without this release clause. Uh, that would not have been possible to negotiate with uh, Holland's dad, Alfie Holland, and then with Mino Raiola, his, his, his manager and agent. Um, so uh, they were happy that they could sign him for a quite... Uh, a uh, small amount of money if you look at 20 million and it's worth now and what he's worth now. So it's great uh, for Borussia Dortmund already now. Um, if you look at the development that Erling has made, he's very thankful and he says so and his dad says so for what he has uh, has experienced and for how he's treated in Dortmund. Um, the club leaves him uh, not alone because uh, they know he's, his ambitions are so big that they don't need to push him. They don't need to motivate him. Uh, Erling Haaland is, is, a, is a monster of a motivation and, and his, his uh, ambitions are gorgeous. I mean, he would never stop. Um, so if you have a player like him, uh, what, what he reminds me of is uh, when you look at British cycling and what uh, Sir Dave Brainsford did with the marginal gains uh, in cycling, just to leave no aspect of uh, performance out of your out of your mind and to check everything that you can uh, to get to the highest level and to get to as best as you can. That's how, how Erling Haaland sees himself, his body and his career and the plans. And he's, he's made smart decisions. He has taken Salzburg as a, as a step when he came from Norway, which was uh, not too big a gap. He, it took him half a year, but then he was there. And after Salzburg, he took Dortmund, which is not the one of the top three or four contenders for, for Champions League wins and victories, uh, but at least the club that uh, guarantees him to play on the highest level for, for a while. Um, and uh, like these smart decisions he's made, he's going to make another smart decision, uh, what his future brings. If he can still continue to play Champions League in Dortmund next year, I'm pretty sure he'll stay for one year, more year and then leave the club uh, that summer 2022. 
um, because that would also uh, make it possible with a release clause and to get some extra money uh, on the hands for, for him and his family uh, when leaving then and to get probably also a better wage because uh, right now a lot of clubs and not only United but also different clubs in England in the Premier League and also in Spain uh, are still struggling and negotiating whether uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what it will do to their finances and how they will get out of this economic crisis that it's at the same time. Uh, so maybe a, a better bargains can be made next summer. Now, in terms of uh, Dortmund's working relationship with United, has the Jaden Sancho situation, has it sort of, has it poisoned the relationship? Because let's be honest, it was... It was painful to watch as a fan. I'm sure it was painful for you to report on uh, as a journalist as well. But it was just a low, a lot of to and fro between the two clubs. And United ultimately didn't give Dortmund what they wanted. And Dortmund held firm. Has that sort of damaged the working relationship between United and Dortmund? Did you, could, do you think that could have any effect on United's chance to sign Holland? No, I don't think so that it uh, has, has damaged the relationships for a long term. Um for for our perspective, from our perspective, it was uh, was a bit funny, and we we're really sorry for for you guys at United and and uh, the the Sky reporters that came to Dortmund to report about a transfer coming up when it was already said in the early January, no, there uh, July, early July, sorry, um, that there was uh, no transfer coming up, and uh, people in England, because United's uh, bosses told so, were still believing that Sancho will come. Uh, but at the same time, it was already a clear decision that it wouldn't. Um, so this was quite uh, yeah, interesting to see because people in England didn't believe what they, what they heard. Uh, and they didn't believe that Germany, uh, that Dortmund would stay firm with what they said. Um, and when you look at transfers before, like uh, like uh, um, Henrik Mkhitaryan, uh, Shinji Kagawa um, and different others, that was... Uh, Difficult for for United to get a good signing from Borussia Dortmund. At the same time, Dortmund made good uh, good uh, transfers and good uh, agreements with United from their perspective. So uh, yeah, it's okay, but nothing that would be uh, a relationship that would be somehow damaged or some somehow infected by what happened in the past because they're they're businessmen and uh, they have uh, they have also the the agents. Um, who are contributing to one or the other side and who are doing the connection work and uh, that would be uh, just professional businessmen and uh, would be no idea about uh, more or less uh, reliable uh, probability that uh, Erling Holland would sign for United or any other club because of things that had happened in the past. Well, th- that in a sense is a good thing, I suppose, for United fans to hear that. But do you, do you feel, what's the word coming out of Dortmund it- is there any chance that Holden leaves this summer at all? Do you feel? Is that literally down towards the price? Is that down towards Champions League qualification? Is that down towards who's coming in as the new manager, as you say? Because, you know, I watched the game between Dortmund and Bayern Munich at the weekend and Holden was levels above. The, obviously, Jaden Sancho wasn't there. You guys have got some injuries. But Holden seemed on a different level to, to where Dortmund currently is as a team. Uh, do you feel like you're talking about his monster ambitions. Do you think they're going to kick in this summer if that Champions League qualification is not in? Yeah, pretty. I'm pretty sure um, Erling Haaland sees himself as a Champions League player and that's the stage he is uh, at his best level, at his best performances. And uh, a year without that would be a, a setback for him, I think, in his mindset. Um, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't love that. Um, if there would be opportunities to, to move on for another club, uh, he would really think about it. Um, and I would uh, be uh, yeah, more or less surprised if he'd stay in Dortmund if the club wouldn't qualify for the Champions League yet again. Um, but at the same time, it's difficult because you see like Jaden Sancho sees himself as a Champions League player too, definitely. Uh, and I'm, there, if you miss to qualify for the Champions League, uh, there might be a very small uh, likelihood that they might sell both players, but uh, I'd say it's not more than 5 to 10%. Well, I'll take 5% because it's better than 0%, right? But it, it, do you think that with with Borussia Dortmund, obviously there's a, there's a long history of, of selling top players to Bayern Munich and, and Bayern Munich's dominance of the, of the Bundesliga has largely been boosted by the fact that Dortmund have given them so many good players. Do you think that there is a chance that Haaland could follow in the footsteps of Robert Lewandowski or is it more likely that Dortmund would prefer to sell abroad rather than to their biggest rival with 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 Holland, mm. 
Yeah, take it one of the other. Other obviously, they would love to sell him abroad and not keep him in the Bundesliga because uh, Bayern Munich is already uh, yeah impossible to break and impossible to to beat for a season, maybe in some matches, but uh, not over a long term. Uh, so they would really rather see him in in the Premier League or or in Spain uh, than at München. Um, but uh, if you look at Erling Haaland, he, like I said, he's made a lot of smart decisions. And if you look at the, his style of play and how far he is now with 20 years, much better than Robert Lewandowski, whom I've seen when he was around the 20s and he was much worse than he is today, definitely. Um, but if we look at the Erling's style of play, he would uh, definitely fit a lot better to Premier League football, which is more more physical, more about speed than, for example, in, in Spain and in La Liga. Uh, where it's more about tactical and more about uh, technical uh, assets that Erling doesn't have so far, uh, which doesn't mean that he could get he couldn't get it. Um, but yeah, I would see him in the Premier League, and that, that's uh, that's a country he knows best. His father knows best, and the type of football that would fit to him best. Uh, and something you mentioned at the start of this conversation, you're saying that Borussia Dortmund's style of play is very much geared towards Erling Haaland and getting the most out of him. Uh, do mm -hmm. you think that? That's quite an important reason as to why he's done so well at Dortmund. And do you think that maybe if you move to Manchester United, for example, would we have to do a similar sort of thing and sort of gear our football towards having a proper... Because we don't, at the moment, have a proper number nine striker. Our, our forwards tend to be sort of inside forwards, maybe converted wingers, players that are more typical, typically comfortable out on the wing rather than somebody who's big and powerful and through the middle like Erling Haaland. Do you think, mm -hmm. do you think the style of Dortmund is really a big reason why he's done so well there? Yeah, definitely. And that's also why he chose Dortmund, because, you know, it was it was for attacking and counter-attacking and doing this, this, this pressing style of football, uh, which was in the last years. And uh, what made a big difference for him was, was the fans, the supporters. Um, when I talked to Erling about uh, this in, I think it was in October, November, he said, no, I, was, I had the offers and I knew some clubs were interested. But one, one afternoon I was... Uh, I was on my couch, I was sitting on the sofa with my dad next to me, and uh, he was almost asleep, and, and I watched football, and I said, wow, this is Borussia Dortmund, why not Borussia Dortmund, this is sensational, look at this atmosphere, look at the stands, yeah? and, and that's why he chose Dortmund too, and uh, obviously that's something he might experience uh, in a similar way at uh, Old Trafford. Uh, on some other stadiums which are really uh, yeah, enthusiastic about football, uh, and that might also contribute to the decision he's going to make. Old Trafford mm -hmm. is it's a wonderful stadium and obviously fans haven't been inside it for a long time and it's it's been painful and it's taken away a big a big aspect of what football is all about. So if, if that was a reason that Holland did join Dortmund, then I could certainly say that's a potential reason why he'd love life as a United player. But thank you very much for your time today, Jürgen. Hopefully this, uh, this interview has given you a bit of insight into what the situation is financially with Dortmund. You know, in terms on the pitch with all the things that are going on this season and a new manager coming in. So I really appreciate your time today, Jürgen. Yeah, it was my pleasure and uh, good luck for United. I know the last years haven't been uh, too busy, too happy for you. Um, and this, this post-Ferguson era has had some struggles and, and difficulties, but I can see now coming up and back again. So I'd love to see a good United. Oh, I'd, I'd like so too. I, I, and I'd love to see Erling Haaland to be part of that. And hopefully <laughs> the... Uh, Hopefully the uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and uh, Holland Links from back in their time at Molde, hopefully that can can be can be an important part of this as well. And, and is that it's I suppose finishing on that question really? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you is that something that that you know from speaking to Holland himself, like in terms of his relationship with Solskjaer, is that something that he actually holds quite dear to himself? Is that important to him? Um... It's good for him that they already have this connection from, from the past, obviously, and they can speak in their own mother tongue, which is uh, always a difference. Sure. Um, but it, uh, it's not the one and only reason for him to choose this club or another club. Um, I think if, if Erling Haaland is uh, making his choice, he will aim at the Premier League, I guess, and then he will aim for the club uh, that has the best circumstances, the best uh, perspective and, and the best... Uh, progress to be to be made when he can develop uh, to his the best way he ever can get. I don't know where this ends and where his borders and, and limits are, but uh, he will find out and uh, he will love to only just join one of the top three clubs. And if it's United or if it's City or if it's a, if it's a new prospering Chelsea, we'll see. Um, I'm pretty sure it will be in England and uh, I'm more or less sure, just to, to round it up, uh, that it will be in summer 22. Wow. Let's 
Let's hope you're wrong. Let's hope it's 2021. Let's hope he joins United <laughs> this summer. But you're probably not going to be. But it's, it's interesting to hear the sort of inside story from Dortmund. So really appreciate your time today, Jürgen. Uh, okay. And uh, I'll speak to you soon, hopefully, again. Okay. Good luck for you. And stay well and healthy. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.